Hello everyone, my name's Ned and I'm a freelance cheesemonger. I'll probably have to explain that to you because I think I invented this job. What I do for a living is talk about cheese, which entails eating a lot of cheese, visiting cheesemong makers who are invariably fascinating and lovely people, and I think it's one of the best jobs in the world. What I've been doing recently is writing a book. Here it is. It's called A Cheesemonger's History of the British Isles. So now you know what it is. And I'll be talking about that and uh, looking at some aspects of British history through the medium of cheese. But first, I want to say some thank yous. I want to thank Patrick McGuigan and Tracy Colley and the Academy of Cheese and the Guild of Fine Food for organising this wonderful event, the British Cheese Weekend. They've done an amazing job. I want to thank all you lovely people for eating cheese and for coming to see me talk, which is nice of you. I want to thank all the cheesemongers who work so hard, especially during all this craziness, to bring us the cheese we need, and especially all the cheesemakers of Britain and Ireland and all around the world who make all this wonderful cheese for us. So, I'm going to talk about a few of the cheeses from my book. There's about 50 in there, which I'd never managed to fit into half an hour. I'm going to try and do six, which is probably crazy, uh, but I always bring too much cheese. So we open in 4000 BC, when the first evidence of cheese making appears in the historical record in Britain. This was something of a scoop, because before uh, this discovery a few years ago, we thought that the Romans came over and taught us cheese making. Then, uh, now I think it was about 2011, some rather brilliant people at the University of Bristol worked out a way of establishing that the traces of fat on shards of pottery found in, in various places in Britain and Ireland were actually milk fat. And this is considered to be the first direct evidence of cheese making in Britain. Um, evidence turned up around the same time in Ireland which I think is rather marvellous. Um, so as I said before then, we thought the Romans came over and taught us cheese. The Romans were a bit cutting about the British and said that not only did we eat our parents, but uh, we didn't even know how to make cheese, but they were wrong. So the first cheese in the book um, was a soft, fresh cheese. I should explain that what I did was I picked cheese for each historical period. I divided all of British history from 4000 BC until now into 10 chapters, which in itself was quite an undertaking. And each chapter, each period gets a cheese. Uh, so our first cheese was a fresh young goat's cheese. And I picked a cheese called Slatelet, made by the late Mary Holbrook on her farm in Somerset. Slatelet was actually goat's cheese. Um, I actually think that they were probably more likely making cow's milk cheeses back then. But I loved Mary and I loved her cheeses and I wanted to use that one. So I did. But anyway, we're going to skip through prehistory and start at 43 BC when the Romans turned up. That sound is Albert, by the way, the local dog. Lovely dog. Uh, so, and our first cheese that we'll be tasting, which is the cheese of chapter two, is a beautiful, hard sheep's milk cheese called Spenwood. And it looks like this. Now, you don't have to buy yourself a whole quarter wheel like I did. I'm just fantastically greedy and really love cheese. So the first thing we're going to do and this will kind of palliate you having to listen to me, is we're going to try some cheese. But before you do, there's a way to taste cheese. When you're on your own at home with your cheese, you can do anything you like. When you're with me, there's a way to taste. There's also a way to cut. Now, you don't need fancy kit for all this, uh, luckily, because as soon as all this started happening, we went to lockdown, I went and packed my cheese cutting kit in the attic, and it's completely ungettable. It's stuck under the ironing board, which I also packed. It's a slightly rumpled look. So I'm just going to use a nice, long, sharp uh, chef's knife. I want the length to make a nice, neat cut. And I'm going to cut a pie slice. So what you want to do when you have these kind of uh, round cheeses is to cut nice, neat pie slices. The reason for that is if you cut straight bits off like this, eventually you're going to end up with a rindy old bit like this. You can't really see you, can you? A rindy old bit like that, see, which is not very nice for anyone. So nice pie slices, I shall start. Mm, such a beautiful cheese. 
So here we have our, our nice little slice of Spenwood. Uh, I'm going to do something a bit non-canonical now. I'm not sure if this is blasphemous, but this is the way I like to do it. I'm now just going to cut that bit of rind off, see? And then I'm going to cut myself pieces like that. There are fancier ways to do this, but that's the way I like doing it. Right, well, I trust everyone's got a piece of cheese. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to observe our cheese. You can tell a lot about cheese by looking at it. This one is a sheep's milk cheese. You might see it better from the whole piece. So it's quite pale. Sheep and goat's milk cheeses tend to be a bit more pale. If we look at a lovely bit of cheddar, cow's milk cheese, you can see it's got a richer, more kind of yellowy, creamy colour. So just by looking at this, I know it's a goat or a sheep. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze my cheese. No, I'm not. I'm going to smell it first. So I know in the world of wine we do nosing, but in the world of cheese we're a bit less posh, so we just smell cheese. Now that's got a beautiful, slightly caramelly aroma. It's got some pineapple, which I often find in hard sheep's milk cheeses, and I find incredibly exciting. No idea why it's there. Um, I ask cheese makers, and they're mystified too, even the people who make it. What you can also do, and this is freshly cut, but you can crack it and smell it at the cracked face and you really get that aroma because aroma is a huge part of experiencing flavor. So we want to do that before we seriously taste cheese. I didn't do this every time I eat cheese. Sometimes I just stuff it in my mouth, but I'm doing it properly now. So after I smell the cheese, I'm gonna squeeze it because thinking about texture was a huge part of experiencing your cheese, the quality of it. Now, this is very important. You can only squeeze your own cheese. You're not allowed to squeeze other people's cheeses. So if you pop into Neil's Yard Dairy or the Courtyard Dairy or Fine Cheese Co and go up and squeeze their cheese before it's yours, they'll be cross with you. So don't do that. So it's a hard cheese. It should be hard. I squeeze it and I feel it's got a lovely firmness. It's not pappy and soft. It's got some moisture. It's leaving just a trace of moisture on my fingertips, but not like a, not an overly amount of moisture. It's not, not, not too claggy. Uh, and the next thing to do is to eat it. So if you're eating cheese at home, you may now start your engines and eat the cheese. I'm going to hold off for a second because I want to talk about what happens when we eat cheese. I like to think of the narrative structure of flavour. Every cheese tells you a story. So a good cheese has complexity and in that it has a sort of narrative. You'll get a beginning as you taste it and then as it warms up and, and coats your palate, you get a, a middle, you know, the flavour starts to develop. And then you get finish. Now, a good cheese should have some length. So even after you've finished your, your morsel of cheese, you should still be tasting it, even for quite a mild, delicate cheese. You get these supermarket cheeses that have numbers on them, you know, like strength 11, it's like spinal tap or something. Even with that strength, often you find that there's no length, the flavour just stops. So I can tell, well, for me, an indicator of quality is that complexity and that length. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to try some. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think that's absolutely glorious. If anyone else has eaten the Spenwood, you can you can tell me about that later. I love that. Um, quite fruity. It's got a lovely salt. There's enough salt, but there's not. Uh, you know, it's not too salty. Just a little bit of acidity. Another thing for me about other than complexity for, for a quality of cheese is, is balance. So you, if you get acidity, it's not necessarily mouth burning. It's not the only flavor. It's not overwhelming all the other flavors. They're all in balance. More of the fruitiness is coming out, even though it's now left my mouth, obviously, because I'm talking to you, not spraying you with cheese. It's left my mouth. I'm still getting flavor and I'm getting more of that fruity flavor. Uh, I bought a few drinks tonight um, because part of the loveliness of my job is matching booze and cheese. Now, I'm not normally a fan of red wine and cheese, or rather, I find it much more difficult to match a red wine and cheese. However, if I'm going to, I would use a nice light red wine. The lovely people at Sharpham's, who also make amazing cheese, have sent me a bottle of Pinot Noir. See, it's nice being a freelance cheese monger. They sent me this lovely bottle of English Pinot Noir, which I'm absolutely thrilled by. So I'm just going to pour myself a splash, if that's okay. Now, I think that a nice light red like this is going to go beautifully with this cheese. One of the reasons for that, for me, is about intensity. So if you're matching a cheese with a drink of any sort, 
the first principle is are they of a similar intensity if you have a really rambunctious cheese and we're going to get to one in a bit um hi marcus uh if you have a really rambunctious cheese you might find that that overwhelms your your lovely light red or conversely if you have a massive aussie shiraz with a, a really delicate to floral sheep cheese like this, it might be too much. But I think it's going to be nice. I'm just going to have a little more cheese. Hmm, oh, that's good. Hmm. Well, oh, I think that's absolutely smashing. I'm just going to have a bit more. Hmm. So, what you can think about in terms of matching intensity. I've had the cheese, I've had the wine, I can still taste both of them. So they're not wiping each other out. My friend Chris Hall, hi Chris, he's a beer writer, he also talks, and I love this, he talks in a more kind of combative way. So I often think about these as cats and they're getting on, having a chat, and he sometimes talks about them kind of duking it out. So I think that works too. Mm. Another thing that we might think about with matching boozes and cheeses is uh, complementary flavours. So... The lovely Spenwood has a bit of florality in it, and I think that this really quite marvellous Pinot also has a bit of something kind of fru fruity and floral. So there's something complementing each other in the cheese. So, Rome, and why have I picked Spenwood uh, for, my, for my Roman cheese? Well, in the British Library, my favourite exhibit of all, and I'm going to show you a picture of it, is a Roman cheese mould. You can keep your organ marbles and your Rosetta Stone and your mummies. It is the Roman cheese mould. It's the best thing you can see in the British Museum. And here is a photo of it. See? Now, I think that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I know I might not. <laughs> maybe not all of you think that. One of the reasons it's so fascinating to me is you see these things in museums all around Britain. And they are very uniform. They're the same size and shape. As almost as if they've been stamped out of moulds, uh, sort of meta moulds, I suppose. So the reason for that, I believe, um, is that they were largely Roman army moulds for army cheese making. The reason is this. The Roman army, if you're, in the, if you're a legionary, you've got an ounce of cheese a day in your ration pack. It's not very much, and it's not Maybe that, maybe a bit less. I wouldn't have much enjoyed being a Roman soldier unless they could have found me a more cheesy uh, job to do there. Anyway, you got an ounce a day. 5,000 men in a full strength legion. That is 5,000 ounces of cheese a day, which is about, let me see, I'm looking at my notes, 140 kilos of cheese a day. So, or about 70 of these whole spinwoods. That's a lot of cheese. They weren't, this is a kind of proto-industrial cheese making. This is not peasants making little soft cheeses to feed the family. This is a kind of standardized, almost industrialized cheese making. So if the Romans didn't teach us to make cheese, what I do think they may have done was to teach us to make cheese on a big scale like that, in a kind of uh, consistent and, and bulky way. Now, also, what floated my boat about that mould is it looked to me pretty much the size and shape of a spenwood. The other thing, this is a hard cheap smock cheese. It's based, by the way, on a pecorino sardo. It's made by Anne Wigmore in Reading. Oh, sorry, outside Reading. Uh, and the cheese that the Roman army ate was a hard sheep smock cheese like pecorino. So it just fits together beautifully for me. And I think that's rather marvellous. The other thing I believe is that for all these thousands of cheeses that the Romans were making in the hundreds of years that they, they um, hung out over here, they didn't ship thousands of cheesemakers over from Rome. I think they brought a few cheesemakers over and then trained the locals, who, as we know, were already keen cheesemakers. And what I love to think about, this is a more techie cheese. Your soft, fresh cheese you could make with a couple of bowls, a colander of some sort, maybe some muslin, a spoon or two, and, and you'd be away. This kind of thing, a hard cheese, takes a bit more tech. You need to heat the milk, so you need a vat that you can heat milk in, some tools for cutting curd. So I think it's a more technical style. And I like to think of the British cheesemakers, who would have been women, by the way, because it was all women who made the cheese for most of history. Uh, until the men figured out there's money in it and, and tried to boot the women out, as is their want, sorry. Uh, um, 
So I think that these women cheesemakers went into the great big Roman dairies and were all like, wow, that's amazing. I think it must have been so thrilling for them to, to see this sort of new technology she's making. It's, I might be entirely wrong. It's entirely possible. We weren't an unsophisticated people back then that we were making more techie cheeses and just that that kit hadn't survived. But anyway, I like to think that the Romans brought hard cheese cheese making to Britain and brought a kind of industrialised cheese making. And I base that on finding these beautiful moulds. The other thing that I imagine the Romans um, did for us in terms of cheese was give us a liking for fancy foreign imports. The Romans were massive cheese fanciers. They were very keen on some Gaulish cheeses, some French cheeses. A particularly popular one was called Vetusican. I'm just checking that I've got that right. Pronounced it right. Vetusican, which came from the Savoie in the Alps. Now, for a cheese to survive a long trip from, you know, from the Alps to, to Rome, it would need to be a fairly hard cheese, a durable cheese, and probably quite large. It's not very really economic to ship small cheeses. If you think of big, hard cheeses that come from the Savoir, Beaufort immediately comes to mind. And we, we, we the French um, cheese theorists believe that Beaufort's been around for a long time. So I like to think that the Romans were into this absolutely glorious Alpine cheese. They also had some native cheeses. There was uh, Vestina, which is a mild breakfast cheese. Um, perhaps a sort of soft, fresh cheese. You might have, you know, if you've ever had Turkish breakfast, you have soft, fresh cheese, some olives, a little flatbread, lovely. Or Velabrum, which is a smoked cheese. Now, when I was a younger monger, I didn't hold with smoked cheeses. I thought you should just make good cheese. You know, don't mess around with it. Don't put stuff in it or anything. You don't smoke cheese. I'm afraid when I found out the Romans were in smoked cheese, I was all like, oh, that's fine. Everyone can have smoked cheese now. That's grand. So the liking, by the way, for sort of foreign imports never really went away. On medieval cheesemonger's slates uh, in London in the Middle Ages, uh, you had Angelo, Angelo, which is a, a Normandy cheese, probably like Pont Levesque. Uh, in the 19th century, um, Victorian Londoners in the working class districts, super keen on Gorgonzola. It was hugely popular. Jewish Londoners were really keen on chowder, which is how we say gouda. Uh, now, that's great. I love all those cheeses. I love all cheese. I love the cheese of the whole world. But it does seem to me that we've always struggled in Britain with having enough pride in our own cheeses. So I found out through doing this research that we've been making cheese here for 6,000 years. So we must be pretty good at it. We've got some glorious cheeses. I'm going to show a few tonight that I think are amongst the great cheeses of the world. So uh, as much as I want you to buy some nice French cheese now and again, even some American cheese, they do make some good cheese. Let's not forget that we make wonderful cheeses here in Britain and let's support them in these difficult times by buying lovely cheese from independent cheesemongers. Moving swiftly on, we're going to leapfrog to the Middle Ages. Now, uh, this is a bit of a trigger warning because my next cheese is, uh, for me, is a product of the Great Plague, otherwise known as the Black Death for 1348. That's about as grim as it's gonna get. This is a story with a happy ending. But here is one of my favorite cheeses in the world, Trithaun's Gorwith Kefili. It's my favorite, one of my favorite cheeses for two reasons. One is it's absolutely lovely, and I'm gonna tell you why. The other is that this cheese is the reason that I'm a cheesemonger. So in 2000, I used to work in the theatre, so I was broke, which is what you do when you're in the theatre, is be broke. And my friend Todd Town said, come down to Borough Market and sell my cheese. I'd never done anything like that before. And I was about to discover that I'd never had any amazing cheese. So a wintry morning in, I think it was November in 2000, I had a bit of this cheese and I realised that all the cheese I'd ever had before was rubbish. I became instantly obsessed with it, with this cheese in particular and cheese in general, to the point where Todd said, look, fella, I'll get you a job at Neil's Yard Dairy if you stop bothering me. And I have never looked back. Never stuck a job longer than two years before then. It's been almost 20 years now. The other reason is that this is a glorious cheese. One of the things I love about it the most is this wonderful rind. You can't feel this. But it feels like felt, like moleskin. I'd like to have a pair of trousers made of go with rind, but my wife says that I'm not allowed to. I'm going to cut a piece. So again, I'm going to cut one of these nice, neat pie slices of this cheese. Uh, 
haven't done an amazing job there. Now, if you're used to kafili as we see it in supermarkets, this may look a bit strange to you because it's got a rind. Also, you'll notice there's kind of two shades. In the center, we've got a kind of white, pure white, crumbly textured cheese. Around the edge, we call this the breakdown, we have a kind of richer, creamier color and texture. And then we have this lovely gray rind. It's called the breakdown because the rind is breaking down the cheese, enriching it and developing flavor. So I don't want to see any of you cutting your rind off. Obviously, I can't see you, so you probably can't, but don't cut the rind off. Try it with the rind. If you don't like it, at least you've tried it. But one of the things I love about this cheese is you've actually got three distinct flavors and textures. The center is more lemony, more citrusy. The outside is creamy and rich. And then you've got this kind of mushroomy flavor on the rind. Let's go. I'm going to do a terrible thing now. I'm going to cut the nose off this piece. In the north, they call that snebbing. It's not, it's not, it's found upon snebbing. Uh, but I'm just going to sneb this cheese for ease. There we go. Do try some if you have any at home. Mmm, mm, so good. I've been eating that cheese for 20 years. Oh my God, it's good. Every time I have some, I feel the same. It's just absolutely glorious. Todd and his brother Morgan, who make it, um, get shed loads of awards all the time. Uh, they won a whole bunch of awards for this in the World Cheese Awards just uh, last year, last winter. And they also won a bunch of awards for their new cheese, Pitchfork Cheddar, which I might mention later. Now, another way to think about matching booze and cheese is what goes together, what grows together, goes together. So I'm going to take a fairly traditional British style of beer, an IPA, and try it with the cheese. Now, obviously, this is, it's Howling Hops, by the way. It's their house, house IPA. It'll have a kind of American influence on it, a bit more kind of fruitiness and intensity in the hop, but I'm, I'm willing to give that a go. Cheers, everyone. Mm. Oh, wow, this fantastic beer. Mm. So the beer is very fruity. Another theory for matching booze and cheese is about contrast. So the cheese has a kind of acidity, particularly around the center, which brings the fruit out in the beer really nicely. Sometimes you even, it can enhance the flavors in either the beer or the cheese. And now I'm getting much more acidity from the lovely cheese and much more fruitiness from the beer. So that was nice. So after the Romans left, there was this thing called the Dark Ages. Uh, now, I, okay, I know that we don't call it that anymore, um, hi Julie, yes, I definitely will get a pair of trousers made of Caffini just for you. Um, uh, where was I? I'm so distracted by the thought of Caffini trousers. Yes, uh, Dark Ages. However, they were dark for me because um, they didn't write anything down. So it was very difficult from about 500 BC, 500 CE until uh, about when the Normans came to find any written evidence of cheese making. There were a couple of things. And one of them was a rather lovely thing, which are the laws of a Welsh king called Hul the Good. Hul the. I apologise to Welsh people for my pronunciation. The reason he was good is he wrote these laws, which were very fair. And he had a lot to say about the rights of women, which was nice. And one of the things he said is that in a divorce, by the way, the women could, could, could ask for a divorce as well, under Hul's rule. One of the things he said is that in a divorce, the woman, the woman gets all the cheeses that are in the brine bath, uh, all the cheeses still in the dairy. And this shows us two things. One, that the dairy was considered the province of women. So I guess when the cheeses went into the barn, what he means, then they're being matured and then they become a part of the, the farm as a commercial business or whatever. But while they were still in the brine bath, they were the property of the women. And the other thing it tells you is that they were brining cheese in Wales in about 900 CE. Caffili is also made in a brine bath. So there is a thousand odd years of unbroken cheese, Welsh cheese history, which I love. So back to the Black Death. I just want to tell you a quick story because I love it so much. Uh, don't worry, it's not particularly sad. We'll leave out the sad bits. It's about a man called John Runwick. John was the reeve of the Manor of Farnham 
a manor in, Sus in Surrey, which is still, uh, and by the way, very beautiful village. Um, so he became the reeve when the plague broke out, which is, you know, a bit of a rough job for him. But he was so professional. He did such a good job of leading his community through this uh, and through all of the vicissitudes of, of that, including a glut on the livestock market, you couldn't get a good price for animals anymore, a lack of labour, all this vacant land which had to be looked after and, 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 and stewarded. And he managed, in the, in the worst year of it all, to produce pretty much the same harvest that they'd produced before all of this was going on. And also, the cheesemaker the, on the manor made the same amount of cheeses that she made in, in a normal year, which was, I'm going to look it up because I love it so much, she made 142 in the summer, I was not bad going, and 26 in the winter, because cheesemakers are tough. So I just like thinking about that, and, and you get it from some simple manorial accounts. There's not much novelistic detail in there. You look at these accounts and you can see a guy leading his community through a very tough time and making a lot of cheese. So I like to think, so John seems to have survived, uh, and I like to think of him sitting around with his mates at the end of all this uh, with some ale and a lovely bit of cheese. Now, I believe that a cheese like this lovely Gorith Kefili is a product of things that happened in society as a result of, of the Great Plague. And what happened was, for the peasants, land was cheaper and wages were higher. And the astute peasants started buying up land, or rather, or, or, or renting it off, off their, their aristocratic landlords, uh, getting big with their higher wages, and becoming a new class, the yeoman farmer. They were the kind of backbone of, of, of British society, if you like, of British rural society. Now, their aristocratic landlords, when they saw these chaps getting more successful, as is their want, raised the rents. So the new yeoman farmers needed to find more ways of making cash money. And one of those ways is to make a high value, uh, low weight product, cheese. If you look at recipes that actually start to appear around the 17th century, so okay, we jumped a few hundred years, uh, they talk about a new milk cheese. It's made with whole morning milk, so lots of cream with a bit of added cream from last night. And it's quite labor intensive. There's a lot of cutting of curd, brining of cheeses, pressing, turning in the cheese heck, which is their name for the cellar, much like the very labor intensive Kefili. And when you look at the kinds of sizes and the texture that I think would come from that method, I think you're looking at a cheese very much like this, which I think is hugely cool. I also realized that I am about two minutes <laughs> from the time that I am meant to stop. So I'm going to go through the rest of cheese history at an incredible rate. This wonderful thing is Stitchelton. It's an unpasteurized, a raw milk Stilton style made by my friend Joe Schneider on the Welbeck Estate in uh, Nottinghamshire. Now to use, to cut a blue cheese, I would use a thin bladed knife as a boning knife. This will do the job nicely because it's a soft cheese and the, the uh, cheese will tend to stick to a wider blade. So a couple of things to observe about this cheese. One is there's not very much blue in it. It's not riddled with blue. When I seek out a great blue cheese, on the whole, I don't want to see very much blue. I want, thank you, uh, <laughs> I want a balance between the cheese itself and the blue. Randolph Hodgson, who uh, owned Niels Arderi um, and was one of my cheese mentors, always said, it's not the blue, it's the action of the blue on the cheese that you're looking for. And that fairly low proportion of blue to cheese is quite a skillful thing to get right. And it involves a lot of patience and, 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 and uh, a certain amount of gentleness. Um, so one thing I think is you can't make fantastic cheese unless you're a decent human being because two of the qualities that you need to make great cheese are patience and sensitivity. This is also wonderfully soft. It's raw milk, so the milk hasn't been sent through a pasteurizer, which tends to bash it about a bit. The milk comes from the farm. It goes from a, a very slow and gentle pump straight into the vat to the cheese room, so it doesn't have far to travel. 
milk is delicate, doesn't like to be bashed about. Also, Joe hand ladles his curd. So this is a very skillful, painstaking and personally physically agonizing thing to do. I can I can do a few ladles of um, of stitched to curd before I have to stop. Also, Joe wants me to stop because I'm doing such an appalling job of it. So wonderfully creamy. I'm going to have some now. Hmm. Absolutely good. This is marvellous cheese. This is quite young, so it's got a lovely freshness. It's got some acidic tang to it. As it ages, it will round out and you get a really rich, creamy, often sweet flavour. Flavour notes I get in Stitchton, this is going to sound a bit odd, are 70s Hubba Bubba, Marmite, like a mammy, and Shreddies, or digestive biscuits, a certain maltiness. So have bubble gum, Marmite, Shreddies. Doesn't sound all that great when you think about it in a Stitchleton. It's absolutely glorious. So Stilton is the cheese of the 18th century for me, partly because it just is associated with the 18th century. I think of red-faced squires quaffing their port and, and, and gnawing on a chunk of Stilton. It's very much that image of the 18th century, but it's also, for me, Stilton was brought to fame by an increase in trade, um, uh, an improvement in roads, uh, a general, um, basically in the 18th century, Britain started to make the jump to light speed. And the fortunes of Stilton were intertwined with that. So one thing is, since the Romans left, our roads were rubbish. If you went back in time and looked at a road in the 17th century, uh, now, obviously, that's what you want to do if you went back in time, 17th century, be to go and look at road. But if you did, you would just think it was a rather nasty, muddy ditch or a bit of rough land in between a couple of fields. Uh, so in the 18th century, two big important things happened. One was the Act of Union with Scotland, which reduced the customs barriers and increased trade. The other thing was the Turnpike Act, which sounds boring as hell, but it meant that roads were better, more well, more well looked after and transport improved. The other thing that happened in the 18th century is that Daniel Defoe invented tourism when he wrote a book called A Tour Through the Whole Islands of Great Britain in 1724. People started traveling around for fun as well as for work. It obviously travel was a lot more fun when you had a decent road. One of the first roads to be fixed up good and proper was the Great North Road that connected London with Edinburgh. And on the way, on that road, about halfway along or so, was a coaching inn called the Bell Inn in a town called Stilton. People went there, they stayed at the Bell Inn, they had some absolutely smashing cheese and they would come back to their friends in London or Edinburgh say, listen, we had this absolute banger over cheese. What's it called? Oh, it's called Stilton. There's a lot of argument about whether Stilton was ever made in Stilton or not. Uh, I'm about 50-50 in a sense. I don't really care. Uh, I get it. If you're the people of Stilton, you might like that draw of the tourist industry. What does interest me is the story of its appearance in Stilton is all intertwined with a chap called Cooper Thornhill who owned the Bell Inn. And I think what this really is, is a story about branding and brand storytelling. Cooper was famous as a horseman. He made a, 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 a legendary ride to back to London and back and won a sack of gold guineas for it. I think there was a kind of halo effect for talking about Cooper Thornhill, the Bell Inn, and the cheese in one, and kind of uh, 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 having a sort of halo effect for the cheese. So whether or not um, it was actually made in Stilton, it was the whole association with that with that place, um, with the pub, with, with, with the place, with Cooper Thornhill, that really got the reputation going. Such that I believe that in the 18th century, if you were a trendy um, urban metropolitan foodie type, you had Stilton on your dinner table. And the other thing you had was port. Now, I am largely not a fan of, of port and Stilton. I actually prefer porter. I was going to show this with a bottle of the Colonel Brewery's incredibly gorgeous Export India Porter, but I drank it yesterday by mistake. Sorry. So why Porter and Stilton? Well, one of the things that we were doing a lot in the 18th century was being at war with the French. It was kind of a national pastime to be at war with the French. Uh, and when we were at war with the French, we couldn't buy any of that lovely wine. So we had to go to Portugal and buy wine that was at the time of lower quality. It was a bit thin 
and it had a long way to travel across the stormy Bay of Biscay. And by the time it got to England, it wasn't very nice. A wine merchant in Porto had the bonzo idea of sticking some brandy in the casks to preserve the wine and inadvertently invented port. When you make port, you stick brandy in the wine, it stops the fermentation, you're left with the sweetness and the richness and the heftiness of uh, port. So I reckon that became a fashionable thing to drink around the middle of the 18th century. And I reckon that that was the cool thing to do was to have port and Stilton. I would try it with a porter. I would also maybe try it with an off dry white like this. This is a, a lovely Tokai dry ferment from Lathwaite. It's one of my favorite wines. Quite simple, it's not massively fancy, a little bit off dry. It's got some sweetness, not too much acidity. I think it would be grand with the cheese. So, the other thing that happened a lot in the 18th century was wars. And my favorite war, if one can have such a thing, was the Great Cheese War of 1766. Oh, I'll just let you think about that while I try some of this marvellous wine. Mm. Outstanding. So, the Great Cheese War of 1766 broke out in Nottingham, and it was over prices, because the thing about all this economic expansion was it meant more trade, and that meant wholesalers buying food in local markets and taking it away to sell in the bigger towns and cities. Also, it meant prices were going up. Furthermore, as much as in 1766 we'd just beaten the French again in the Seven Years' War uh, and beaten them so comprehensively at this point that we actually gave some of the land back, it cost a lot of money. And as usual, that the, uh, the burden of that tax went on the poor. So there were a lot of food riots around this time. Rioting broke out over the price of cheese in Nottingham in October 1766. Uh, the mayor came out to remonstrate against the writers and was knocked over by a rolling cheese and injured. Um, I think it was probably a red Leicester, if you think about the area, and they're quite big wheels of cheese, that would have been uncomfortable. A poor man was, was shot and killed, actually, when the dragoons came out. And the thing was, he was a farmer who was protecting his own cheese, so that is the first and I think last recorded instance of cheese-related friendly fire. There was uh, the hijacking of che armed cheese convoys traveling between towns. There was cheese river piracy. And best of all, there was the great siege of a local cheese warehouse where a bunch of cheese rioters laid siege to a cheese store and were driven off by cannon firing grape shot. Now that's like a gigantic shotgun and it causes dreadful slaughter. So they must have really wanted that cheese. At first, these rioters were driven off, and then the cheesemongers got a cheese posse together on horseback and chased the cheese rioters to the local town of Castle Donington, which is, you know, where they have the big heavy metal concert, so, you know, all sorts of malarkey's been going on there. But the local JP wasn't particularly interested in uh, imprisoning these people and pretty much refused, which made the cheesemongers cross, um, and they uh, were, were, weren't very nice about it, and the townspeople got more and more angry and finally drove off the cheesemongers who ran back to their um, cheese warehouse where they were once again besieged and this time successfully driven off and the rioters took possession of the disputed cheese. Uh, the local JP, um, uh, the local uh, vicar rang the church bells at the success of the cheese thievery and the local publican opened a thing of ale so they were all behind these guys. Um, the cheese rioting and fighting went on for days and days, and they eventually had to get the heavy cavalry into a store order. People, There were trials, some people were executed, some people went into hiding, and some people were transported for stealing cheese. I know this partly because my friend Dave Holton, who's an Australian cheesemaker known as Aussie Dave, well, he was briefly known as Mozzie Dave after a tangle with malaria. So he makes cheeses named after people who are transported to Australia for stealing cheese. And he hasn't run out of names yet. So cheese is a serious business. Moving swiftly on to one of my favourite cheeses. I keep saying that. You know, every cheese I have is my favourite cheese. One of my favourite cheeses of all time, cheddar. One of my favourite cheddars of all time, this is Westcombe cheddar, made by the lovely Tom Calvert on his farm in Somerset, 
Somerset, the West Country, is the home of proper good traditional cheddar. Look at this beautiful sunset yellow colour. Look at the cleanness of it, the perfection of that, the consistency of that texture. This is just fantastic cheese making. Now, a lot of cheddar, particularly the supermarket stuff, very acidic, very strong. And people people get into that and they talk about, I want a cheddar that will hurt my mouth or burn my mouth. you know. And I like to say, well, why do you want food that hurts? I want food that's nice. I think proper good cheddar, on the whole, should have that restraint and that balance I talked about earlier. By the way, the reason I'm trying all these cheeses is that, and this is the magic of cheese, Cheese changes from day to day. Every batch can be a bit different because the cows were in a different field or the weather was a bit different or the uh, cheesemaker was in a funny mood, you know, and this all affects the flavour and the texture. So I always try cheese. When you're buying cheese, when, when we get to go back into shops again, always try it. Also, we cheesemongers love to talk to you about cheese, so we'll love it if you try the cheese and taste it. It's always worth trying. Now... When we squeeze this, it's quite soft, and it might surprise you if you're used to harder cheeses. This is uh, harking back to older-style recipes when it's a bit softer, a bit milder, perhaps a bit sweeter. I'm going to try some now. Mmm. Fantastic. So creamy. Absolutely glorious. This will be another one to try with um, a pale ale. Mm. Oh, yes. So that's a bit like having apple and cheese because it's so fruity, that beer. I'm getting a kind of apple cheese thing. I'd also like to try it with the wine. I'm going to talk a bit more first, try not to get too hammered. Cheddar is my cheese of the 19th century. For me, the cheddar that we're eating now is kind of the result of Victorian cheese making, which is in itself arguably the result of the Industrial Revolution. So one thing about the Industrial Revolution is that markets just blew up. There were more people, there were more workers, um, there was more stuff to sell. Uh, and the cheesemakers of Somerset and the West Country in general needed to make a more consistent product uh, it was more swiftly. One of the problems was that you had a great cheesemaker, like Tom, for example, who makes fantastic cheese. But on Tom's day off, you know, Jerry comes in, he's not so good. And that batch isn't as good. You can't sell it for as high a price. The other problem was that in the 1850s, the Americans figured out how to make cheese in a factory. They also got taught how to make absolutely fantastic cheddar by one of our greatest cheese makers, a man called Mr. Harding. You might think that was an odd thing to do. Mr. Harding was just such a nice man. He went and taught an American fellow how to make great cheddar and then told all his fellow cheese makers, listen, I've just taught the Yank to make cheese, so you better up your game. So we were dealing with um, cheaper imports from the States and we needed to make consistent cheese. To do this, Somerset cheesemakers hired a, a, a scientist called Dr. Frederick J. Lloyd to figure out, and I'm going to, I love the quote here. He said, to develop, he was going to develop a complete understanding of the chemical process of cheesemaking. Now, what I love about that is that Victorian certainty that you could have a complete understanding of cheese. I believe that cheese is fractal in that the more you look at it, the more complicated it becomes. The cheese is eternal and so complex that no one could ever be 100% certain about any given aspect of cheese making. So I love his certainty, bless him. To do this, Lloyd got together with an amazing young cheesemaker called Edith J. Cannon. Now, Edith was a bit of a prodigy. prodigy. She started cheese making on the family farm when she was 14. She won a uh, first prize for her cheese at the Froome Agricultural Show when she was, I think, 18 or so. And the Bath and West Society hired her to run their cheese teaching courses. Now, you think in the Victorian period, a young woman being put into a position like that, um, I think, is marvellous uh, and such an achievement. Um, she was obviously a fantastic cheesemaker. So they got together and, and Lloyd um, spent, I think, about a year or so doing the study into cheddar making and he, he, he wrote this book it's a very very dry book in high victorian prose about the chemistry and process of cheese making i read it so that you don't have to what shines through in the book and i absolutely love is his huge respect for miss cannon now i hope she came from a famous cheese making family so uh, and that the method was known as mr cannon's method 
But Lloyd, Dr. Lloyd, always called it Miss Cannon's method after her. And I, I think that's really lovely. So he came out at the end of it with a more complete understanding of cheese making. And the variable he picked, this is going to be a bit geeky, but go with me. The variable he picked for people to really observe and control to, to, to make consistent cheese was acidity and the development of acidity. Some cheesemongers are a bit upset about this and feel that what that's led to is an obsession with acidity and cheddar making. And if you try some of those um, mature block cheddars from the supermarket, you see I don't like them very much. They are just about acidity and there's nothing else. And if that is the baleful influence of, of Dr. Lloyd, that's a shame. But I also like to think that because he worked with Edith so closely, that there's a bit of Edith Cannon in all of our great um, farmhouse cheddars that we have now which makes me well happy. When I rang Tom Calver to uh, go down to his farm and have a look at cheese making for the book, I said, do you, um, have you heard of someone called Edith Cannon, Tom? He said, yeah, she used to make cheese on the farm, which set me off. You know, my wife had to come and she thought I'd won the lottery or something, because uh, I'm so excited about it. Went down to the farm, did a bit of um, milk some cows actually, uh, which is an interesting thing to do. Uh, and, and Tom pointed out a little stone building said look that's her dairy over there which i burst into tears and tom laughed and said yeah everyone cries all the cheese always cry when they, they find that out so i think that's lovely that continuity tom's farm is an amazing place um i love farms anyway but there are two smashing things about tom's farm one is that he smokes cheeses in an old um bt red telephone box painted black of course but well cool the other is his unbelievably cool james bond mastermind criminal cheese store which is cut into the side of a hill as a colossal robot door. He's got a cheese robot to turn cheese. It's an amazing place. See, I have a fantastic job. We come now to the 20th century and World War II, which was a bad thing. And it was a bad thing for cheese. Um, it was a bad thing, particularly for Wensleydale cheese. So we have here uh, Hawes Wensleydale. It's made in the town of Hawes in, in the Yorkshire Dales in Hawes Creamery. They make a few different cheeses and this one is called Kit Calvert Wensleydale. So it's a traditional cloth bound Wensleydale. See it's coming at it comes in a in a cylinder not in a block. It's made with animal rennet that gives it more creaminess. It's cloth bound uh, matured for longer. It's a lovely cheese. It's named after a Yorkshire hero called Kit Calvert who saved Wensleydale repeatedly. I think He's dead famous. If you got to Yorkshire, Cumbria, even Lancashire, and you say the name Kit Calvert, people know who you're talking about. They even cheer. I think he should be a national hero. But let's try the cheese first. So very different texture from the cheddar. Paler too. You see that? It's a softer, creamier texture, but it doesn't have the breakdown of a Gorwith. A lovely, clean, just kind of just fresh sour milk aroma. Mm. Such a comforting cheese, Wednesday Dale, I find. This is um, of a family of cheeses unique to Britain called the Territorials, which include Kefili, Lancashire, Red Leicester, Wednesday Dale, just trying to think if I've missed any out. I know I'll get told off. Double Gloucester, single Gloucester. They're often quite mild. Now, mild cheese is something I think that you grow into. And when I was a younger monger, I liked all the big guns, really powerful Montgomery's, Cheddar, some Stilton, great cheeses. As you get more into it, you find mild cheeses can be really fascinating because it doesn't come and whack you in the face. You've got to go out to it. You've got to reach out to it. Um, do a bit more work. I'm re I really love this cheese. I get I get a green herb flavour, a kind of dill, cucumbery flavour from it. I absolutely love this. Is a session cheese. I can eat a ton of this stuff. So Kit Calvert, during the Depression, uh, he pointed out that um, life is so awful for farmers that they didn't even notice the Depression. Anyway, during the Depression, um, the Milk Marketing Board decided they were going to stop. Um, cheese making in Hawes. They were going to turn over all the production to liquid milk. Um, and on one day, a chap 
from the milk marketing board went to Oak Hall's to kind of strong arm the local farmers into signing contracts to sell their milk as liquid milk rather than make cheese. And Calvert felt it would be disastrous for business, but also that his beloved Wensleydale cheese that he argues, and I think very compellingly, has been made for since the monastic period, so at least a thousand years in the Dales, that that would disappear. And so he, um, the chap for the marketing board said there's no outlet for your milk other than to sell it to us and calvert said there is uh and the fellow said what and he said the sewer so he was just going to chuck all the milk he went out and he put together a consortium of local businessmen that day to to uh, set up a kind of cheese consortium involving local creameries to make cheese he was so up for this that he put up his own money and he was mortgaged to the hilt at the time this was a crazy thing for him to do and that was his spirit i think in the during World War II, he had to save Wensleydale again, uh, not just from the bombs of the Luftwaffe. Masham Greenbury was, was hit by a, a landmine drop from a plane, like a colossal bomb and horribly damaged. But because of this consortium, they were able to look after each other and protect each other and help the Masham producers. But the Ministry of Food had started rationing cheese in 1941. So, so for a cheesemonger or a cheese fancier like me, 1941 would have been the darkest days of the war because the ration was an ounce a week. That's, it wouldn't even cover a cracker, and it's appalling. If you were a lumberjack or a canal boat driver, you got a pound a week. So I'd have immediately learned how to drive canal boats if I'd been in the war. Anyway, now it's week. In order to cut such a small piece of cheese, you needed hard, dense, firm cheeses. Wensleydale at times was a soft, creamy blue cheese. It was a gourmet product. Some people loved it more than Stilton. Um, it was an absolutely different animal to this, this cheese. It was too soft. So Calvert encouraged cheesemakers to change the recipe, move to a harder, uh, more dense cheese to save cheese making in, in, in the Dales, um, to save that culture, to save the business. A lot of the traditional makers who were women working on their family farms just stopped making cheese because they hated it. They carried on making their softer cheeses and then these were downgraded by the graders and sent to factories uh, to be turned into processed cheese, which is a, an abomination that's been with us for a long time. So this cheese in its kind of quite firm texture uh, and relatively low moisture is actually a product of that wartime um, economy, um, which is not, I love it, it's a fantastic cheese. Uh, so I'm, you know, in a sense, I'm glad about that. Um, Recently, a few cheesemakers have been reviving some old recipes. So if you want to try something more like a pre-war Wednesday, there's Richard III, um, or there's a cheese called Fellstone, also known as Winyeats Wednesday, which you can get from the Courtyard Dairy, um, which is a much creamier, often this has got, got some blue in it, and going back to that, that, that kind of old style. Um, after the war... Calvert carried on running the Wensleydale Creamy until he retired in uh, 67. In 1977, he was given an MBE, which he thoroughly deserved for saving Wensleydale. And after his retirement, he ran a bookshop and translated the Psalms into Dale's dialect, which I think is a lovely thing. In 1992, Wensleydale was under threat again when... Um, I think Express Dairies, one of the larger companies, wanted to close down the local creamery and start making Wensleydale in Lancashire. Now, if you know anything about um, Yorkshiremen and Lancastrians, there's a little bit of argy-bargy there, and that would have upset a lot of people. The manager of the dairy and some local businessmen got together and did a buyout and kept it as a local business. They run it as a co-op. They use milk from the local farms. So to me, that is just a lovely story, and Calvert would have been pleased as punch if he'd known about it. In 1995, the film A Close Shave came out and we discovered that Wallace and Gromit's favourite cheese was Wensleydale. And this did a lot for the fortunes of Wensleydale. It became an internationally famous brand at that point. So the story of Wensleydale is a happy one. After the war, British cheesemaking was not in good shape. By the 70s, so many of the traditional cheesemakers just closed down during the war. The other thing that started to happen post-war was the rise of supermarkets who didn't particularly want these kinds of difficult to cut round cheeses, hard to stack. You know, they wanted nice square cheeses, easy to cut, uh, easy to stack, more consistent. Uh, one might say a bit boring. 
So um, traditional cheese making, small producer cheese making in Britain was in a really bad way. By 1974, around the time of the famous cheese sketch of Monty Python, where there isn't any cheese, there barely was any proper traditional cheese. There were only 62, I think, farms still making cheese in Britain, uh, which sounds like a shame, but don't worry. There's a happy end to all this because then there started the Great British Cheese Renaissance where um, people, I think, bored of, 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 of the boring industrial products, started making their own cheese. Val Bynes, a wonderful cheese making teacher, told me she reckoned one of the reasons for this was the TV show The Good Life that came out at the time, which was all about a couple being self-sufficient. And people saw that and thought, I'll have a go at that. Economy went into a downturn, so people got nice redundancy packages, which they took and set up small holdings or little dairies up buying milk and making cheese. I also said to Val, how come they weren't making traditional cheeses? Why didn't they start making more farmhouse cheddar or more double Gloucester? And said, well, they'd all done package holidays to, you know, France and Spain, and they'd had all these fancy foreign imports, so they fancy trying a bit of that. So a lot of the cheeses of the, the cheese renaissance in the late 70s and 80s were based on continental recipes or methods like Mary Holbrook's Timsborough, based on a Valence, a French recipe. For whatever the cheese they were making, um, the British public realised that, you know, eating lovely cheese is more fun. Shops like Neil's Yard Dairy were driving that a lot. Randolph Hodgson, the owner of the shop, was driving around Britain looking for, for lovely cheeses still remained shops like the fine cheese company set up um, and there was a real flowering of, of of interest in cheese and making of cheese and i think that this is still going for me now the two key movements in the british cheese ongoing british cheese renaissance are the rise of the territorials so in 2005 the clark's family started making a proper good cloth bound raw milk red leicester on their farm that was the first really trad Red Leicester to be made for about 50 years. There's these cheeses like the Fellstone, the, the, the pre-war Wensleydale, there's a new double Gloucester. So people are going back the, the, to Trithowan's Gorwith Kefili is another example of the, this resurgence of territorial cheese making. The other thing which I totally invented uh, is postmodern cheese. So these are novel varieties of cheese that are not based on a continental recipe, not based on a traditional farmhouse double Gloucester, but are a new or a hybrid of different methods. I want to introduce to you the last cheese of the evening, Renegade Monk, uh, which is a fantastic hybrid of a washed rind and a blue cheese. Washed rinds are the marmite of the cheese world. They divide people, probably just exactly down the middle into those people that think like me that are an absolutely glorious experience and those people who think, how can that be a food stuff? Uh, you wash the young cheeses in brine. It encourages this pink, sticky rind to grow, which has uh, notes of the barnyard, let's say, if we're being polite. Um, notes of the barnyard. But Renegade Monk is also a blue cheese. So Marcus Ferguson, who makes it, adds some blue mold culture to the milk and then pierces the cheese so that it develops a bluing. So you get a mixture of that barnyardy note from the washing and a bit of the kind of peppery piquant flavour of a blue. I haven't tasted any for ages, so I don't know where this has been going or how it's going to go. I'm hoping. So yeah, they're not really bluing up. I think the paste is too dense exactly does maybe too liquid for the blue veins to form but I st you still get some of the flavor of the blue in it <laughs> oh yes oh, fantastic Marcus thinks I doesn't like his cheese I don't like his cheese because I'm Whew. I tend to describe it as extreme cheesing it's a bit like if you've ever been dumped by a wave, you know, that sensation you get in the back of your nose when you've been dumped by a really massive wave. It's a bit like that. My beer of choice to have with a washed wine like this would be the Colonel Brewery India Export Porter, which I accidentally drank yesterday. So I'm going to try this Saison, which um, fell into my arms yesterday. A sort of farmhousey traditional style. I think it will have the authority to deal with the Renegade Monk. That was a terrible pour. I'm just going to wait for my beer to settle. So, postmodern cheese, the Renegade Monk is an example. Brevibach is uh, a soft, 
mould ripe and sheep's mould cheese made by Carrie Rimes in, in Wales, which is not exactly a hybrid. It's kind of based on the French recipe. Uh, Mozzie Dave, Dave Holton, makes a cheese called Edmund Tew, which is named after a convict who was transported to Australia for stealing cheese. Edmund Tew is kind of a long, that's a French style, but it's got Dave's own spin on it, so it's got its own flavour. And then there is the Renegade Monk, which I can still taste, and I know that I'll be tasting for some time. If I get a kiss from my wife tonight, I'll be well lucky. I'm going to try out this marvellous beer. Mmm. So that lovely barnyardy flavour in the saison is working beautifully with the cheese. They stand up to each other wonderfully. It's a lovely mouth feel from the creamy cheese and the creaminess of the beer. It's a fantastic match. So I have talked for exactly twice the amount of time I was supposed to talk. Sorry, everyone. Um, I've never managed to get one of these under the line ever. I'm doing better than last night when it was four times over the amount. So I hope that's been interesting for you. Um, just to kind of close, I guess, I would say that the fortunes of British and Irish cheese have ebbed and flowed over the centuries, even the millennia. And we're in a bit of a sticky patch at the moment, obviously, as most of you well know. Um, but thankfully, the best thing you can do about that is to buy lots of cheese and to buy it from the lovely independent cheesemongers. So I'm going to sign off. Stay safe. Stay well. Eat more cheese. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.